Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. As we greet you on this, the uh, 18th day or the 19th day of Ramadan. Um, uh, in the blessed month of Ramadan uh, uh, from the studios of the Islamic Broadcasting Network here in my native island of Trinidad with Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh This has been uh, for me a sad uh, Ramadan because I have lost during this Ramadan some of those who were very dear and close to me, but it was their good fortune. But Allah called them away from this world in blessed Ramadan. Just yesterday, my beloved uncle, uh, Taufik Hussein, passed away in Vancouver. And uh, we pray that Allah might have mercy on the soul of my beloved uncle, my father's cousin, uh, his father and my grandfather were brothers. Uh, Uncle Taufik was about almost 90 years of age, but very, very active uh, in the Islamic mission. And uh, with my students, he was constantly interacting on the internet. Uh, very active, mashallah, mashallah. And we're going to miss, we're going to miss you, Uncle Taufik. We pray that Allah might have mercy on your soul. Uh, the funeral will take place today in Vancouver. I met with Uncle Taufik for the last time uh, and for the first time uh, in 2000, I think, I went to Vancouver and spent a wonderful week with him in Vancouver. And uh, in this blessed month of Ramadan, it is, a, it is a blessing for him that Allah called him away to his mercy in this month. And we ask you to kindly raise your hands and make dua. For my dear uncle Taufik Hussein, uh, who has now passed away to Allah's mercy, rahimahullah. Um, it was because of uncle Taufik, actually, that I got to know uh, that my father's family uh, came from Afghanistan. Because my own father had told me when I was just 14 years of age, and when I was 15, uh, uh, my father had told me that our family came, my father's family came from Hyderabad in India. But Uncle Taufik was able to add to that. He said, no, the family came originally from Afghanistan, or maybe the border between Afghanistan and Iran, and their next door neighbors. And then from there, they went down to, to Hyderabad in India. And then from Hyderabad, we were brought to, as indentured laborers to work in the sugarcane plantations here in the Caribbean. And that's how we ended up in Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah. So may Allah have mercy on the soul of Brother Uncle Taufik, our beloved uncle. We also lost Dr. Asip, the blind, the blind medical doctor who, who healed through herbs and plants. And uh, he traveled from Indonesia twice to Kuala Lumpur to meet with me, to treat me, to provide medicine for me, and so on. And uh, he was a man, Allah had gifted him with the healing touch, mashallah. And Allah has called away Dr. Asip from uh, Java in Indonesia. We pray that Allah might have mercy on his soul. It is in, in this Ramadan, I also lost my beloved son, not my biological son, my spiritual son, Alif Baksh, uh, two, two weeks ago. Uh, his father was my very dear friend, Nazam Baksh, and I miss Alif Alif, I loved him so much. And I ask you also to kindly raise your hands and make dua for Alif Baksh. I loved him so much that Allah might have mercy on his soul and on his father as well, Nazam Baksh. Sham, Shamsuddin Masahud was my dear friend. We both were young men together in our teenage, and we both traveled from Trinidad to Guyana on a Muslim youth movement tour of Guyana in 1961. I was just 19 years of age. 
and uh, Shah Masahud, Shamsuddin Masahud traveled with me and Allah called him away from this world. I've lost my dear friend. May Allah have mercy on his soul. On that same trip to Guyana in 1961, when I was 19, uh, I was the head of the debating team. And we had other sports and so on. And we lost everything in that tour. The Guyanese defeated us in everything. But we won the debate, alhamdulillah. We won the debate. Be it resolved that the splitting of the atom has done more harm than good for mankind. That was the topic. And my assistant who was uh, on me on the, with, the t with me on the team was my beloved brother Mumtaz Ali. Uh, I loved him so much. In fact, I used to say to my teacher, Maulana Padur Rahman Ansari, I, say, I used to say, Maulana, I am not the one who should be here studying with you. Mumtaz Ali should have been the one here studying with you. That was my love for him. He was a few years older than me, and he, would, he taught me many things about Islam, yes, and I pray that Allah might have mercy on his soul. Mumtaz died, I think it was 1995, while performing the Hajj. And uh, during this Ramadan, uh, Mumtaz's son, Taufik, Taufik also died and I attended his Salatul Janazah. May Allah have mercy on the soul of Taufik as well as on Mumtaz Ali. Imam Iqbal, I could not even attend his funeral from uh, Sipariya. Uh, a village in which my mother lived, inshallah. This, uh, this was a lovely imam. I loved him so much. May Allah have mercy on his soul. Imam Iqbal, I could not even attend your funeral, imam. May Allah have mercy on your soul, imam. Um, my dear, but before Ramadan, I lost uh, Nashid Abdul Khalik, uh, who was born in Trinidad, who lived in the United States and then worked in Saudi Arabia with Aramco for so many years and who was uh, a very energetic in the Islamic mission, uh, he had a website called Ascertaining the Truth. So maybe you can go to, the, to Google and just type in Ascertaining the Truth and you'll get his website and you see the enormous work that he did. And Allah called him away from this world a few months ago. And before that, of course, I lost uh, Shirazuddin Adam Shah, who was my assistant uh, in Malaysia a young man and who did so much, so much for organizing conferences on riba. One man did it, yes, one man, my student Shirazuddin Adam Shah. May Allah have mercy on his soul. And every time, he, I think he must have organized about four or five international conferences on riba. And we had people, scholars from all over the world coming to Malaysia for those conferences. And every time he would organize a conference, he would invite Dr. Muhammad Mahathir, the former prime minister, who now was once again prime minister, to come and give the feature address. And we would go to Dr. Mahathir, myself and him, Shirazuddin, and we'd invite Dr. Mahathir. And uh, Dr. Mahathir will always accept the invitation. The first time we went, Dr. Mahathir sat with me for almost an hour, maybe about 45 minutes. And most of the time he was talking to me about the Quran. And he was very appreciative of my teacher, Mawlana Fadlur Rahman Ansari and his work on the Quran. This was Doctor, my first meeting with Dr. Mahathir, who is now the Prime Minister once again of Malaysia. And so Shirazuddin would organize these conferences on Riba. And the last one, however, that he organized, it was not Dr. Mahathir, but General Muhammad Muhammadu Bukhari, who came to form a president of Nigeria and who came to get, deliver the feature address of the conference. And I met with General Muhammad Baharu, and now he's once again the president of Nigeria. Um, uh, we were very happy to meet with him, to listen to him. He also listened to my lecture uh, before leaving that conference. Um, so we have lost Shirazuddin Adam Shah as well, and I, on this occasion, this is Ramadan, this is the 18th day. Is it the 18th or the 19th? Maybe it's the 18th day of Ramadan. And uh, uh, we pray that Allah might have mercy on them all. I love them all so much. Uh, on the last occasion, I made an announcement about a, a young, someone who wants to build a Muslim village in the remote Moroccan countryside. 
and I asked that if you would like to join with him in your effort, do please send me an email. <laughs> and I was absolutely amazed at the number of people who contacted me that they want to join in this effort uh, to build this Muslim village in the remote Moroccan countryside. Well, I want to say to you today, first of all, I cannot help with visas. So please don't contact me for advice. You want to migrate to this country or that country and you want to know how to get a residence permit or residence visa. I cannot help with a permanent resident visa. I cannot help you with that. So please, please, please leave me out of that. But if, if you build a Muslim village in Morocco, in the Moroccan countryside, then I am telling you in advance, I will come inshallah to visit you in that village. Uh, so many of you want to come to Trinidad while I am here in Trinidad. But please don't come. <laughs> Not while I'm writing. Not while I'm writing my books. I left Malaysia and came back to Trinidad to write the book on Dajjal because I couldn't do it in Malaysia. There are too many visitors in Malaysia from all over the world. And too, much, too busy in Malaysia. So I left Malaysia. I came back to Trinidad to get the peace and quiet to write my book. On. And then while writing my book on Dajjal, I realized it could not be one book. There have to be several books. And the first book, Alhamdulillah, is already finished. Uh, Dajjal, the Quran, and Awwal zaman It's available in Britain. It's available in Malaysia. It's available on my... Uh, bookstore imranhussein.com but not yet available here in Trinidad it's not, it's not reached as yet hmm? and I'm working on my second book on the Dajjal it's a very exciting book I'm enjoying it entitled From Jesus the True Messiah to the Dajjal the False Messiah a journey in Islamic eschatology hmm. but I had to interrupt the writing of that book because I made, I made arrangements to conduct a seminar on riba. Because of the urgency of the subject of riba, what is it? strange things are happening in the world of money. And we're going to be talking a little bit again about that later on. Um, so I have organized this session on riba, an all-day seminar on riba, uh, in London on July the 29th. And then the second seminar, all day seminar on riba in Manchester on August the 25th. And the good news for you in that area of the world, Manchester, is that the next day after the seminar, August 26th, at five o'clock in the afternoon, I have been invited by an Orthodox Christian church uh, in, um, what's the name of? that town, Leeds. Leeds is, I believe, I've never been to Leeds, but I'm told it's about one hour's drive from Manchester. So I have, I'm, I'm going to address the Orthodox Christian community. I think they're Greek Orthodox in Leeds, in their church, on the 26th at five o'clock. And they have said that my students are welcome to attend. Yes, so you, if you're Muslim, you can also come and join us in Leeds on that day, the 26th at 5 o'clock, uh, on uh, the, the, I think it's a subject on the conquest of Constantinople in Islamic eschatology, yeah. Um, so because of the two seminars on Riba, one in London on July 20, 29th, and the other one in uh, Manchester on August 25th, I was forced to now revise my book on Riba, which I six while I was in New York. I, I took maybe two, three years to research and write that book, but it was completed by 1996, I remember. And uh, at that time there was no internet. I didn't even know how to put in the Arabic text of the Quran in my text of my book. <laughs> and now, I decided I have to bring out a second edition of that book for the seminar. I don't know who told me to do that. I thought maybe I could finish the work in two weeks or three weeks or a month. 
And since I returned to Trinidad on, on, on April 3rd, I have worked for two months nonstop and still not yet finished. <laughs> yes, so the book on Dajjal, the second book on Dajjal is packed up there waiting. And I'm working day and night, day and night to get this book on Riba, the second edition, revised edition, because so much has happened since, the, since 1996 in the subject of the banking and, and money and the market and so on. Um, uh, so I'm working on that book and I don't want visitors, please. But I do have good news for you. And that is why we don't have a Muslim village in Trinidad, the project of one being established. What we are going to do now is to establish a Muslim resort. Yes, alhamdulillah. So if you come to visit me next year, not this year, please don't come this year, next year, then instead of having to stay in a hotel which is not convenient at all, at all, at all, and too expensive, too expensive, we will be building huts in the remote countryside. Uh, there will be one bedroom huts, some of them might be two bedroom, and uh, they will be furnished, yeah. And uh, you can come, you can come with your families, you have an affordable, the, the brother who is going to be uh, spending, the, the building the, this project, uh, it will have it available to you at an affordable rate, daily rate, yeah. And uh, you can come with your families, it will be the remote countryside, almost the forest, and not too far from the sea. So there will be a car or so you can rent at a very, very uh, affordable rate and drive down to the sea, not too far. And um, I will be there, inshallah, in this resort. So that's the good news for you, inshallah, by next year. Please pray that this project for a Muslim, uh, a Muslim resort in Trinidad and Tobago um, would succeed, inshallah. Um, I have some announcements to make, some more announcements to make, and that is that today um, we were supposed to have a Ramadan special session in Barakpur Islamic Center um, at uh, 10.30 this morning. But the Barapo Islamic Center has requested a postponement. Uh, it's clashing with their um, preparations for iftar and so on. And uh, they prefer to have it after Ramadan. So now, please don't go down to Barapo today. No, it's, it's a Saturday. You're Musabt. And it'll be at the time of Maghrib. And our topic will not be how to study the Quran, no. Our topic will be, take a note, Explaining Dajjal, the false messiah. Explaining Dajjal, the false messiah. If you are Christian, you will be fascinated with this subject. You're welcome to come. It's not the masjid, no, it's a big hall. Uh, it's a beautiful barrack boy. That's a remote countryside again. It's Islamic, uh, the, is, the, um, the uh, barrack boy Islamic center, that's what it's called. Um, I will give you a telephone number in a subsequent lecture that you can call uh, for direction to the Barak Boy Islamic Center. And that will be on June the 23rd, Saturday, June the 23rd. And it will be at Maghrib time, uh, which is about 6.30. So after the prayers, the lecture will probably start about 7 o'clock. And Muslims, uh, I mean Hindus are welcome to join us, uh, Christians are welcome to join us. Um, and uh, uh, the topic again is explaining the Jal, the false messiah. Next week, oh before we turn to next week, let me talk about last week. We talk about next week just now. Last week I went to Las Lomas. I don't know, I didn't know what's the meaning of the Spanish word, Las Lomas, Las Lomas. So they said to me, Las Lomas means the hills or the mountains. It's a hilly area, uh, hills and dales. It's the remote countryside and it's beautiful. I loved Las Lomas. And uh, the Imam at the masjid is like a son to me, Imam, Imam Asif, I pray. And I ask you to pray 
that Imam Asif, my son Asif, may one day inshallah become an outstanding scholar of Islam uh, in this country and for this region. And we had an excellent session last Sunday morning, Yawmul Ahad, on how to study the Quran. The, the villagers all came out for that session uh, at, the, at the Las Lomas, the hall of the Las Lomas Masjid. And I loved that area so much. And I have my student there as the Imam, that I promised them I'll be coming back again to Las Lomas again and again. Yes, you're probably going to be fed up of me in Las Lomas. It is so beautiful out there. Um, what I would like to recommend, this idea came to me while I was there, that not only must you learn the Arabic language to be able to understand the Quran when it's being read and recited, but it will be so wonderful if you could also learn spoken Arabic. So if you travel to the Arab world, you'll be able to speak and communicate spoken Arabic. And so I believe it will be an excellent idea in Las Lomas if you can invite a few families from, say, Morocco. But they must be families with people who have uh, ability to, to, to teach the Arabic language, uh, spoken Arabic, fusha. And if these families can come and be located in Las Lomas, which is a nice remote countryside area, uh, then the whole of the village of Las Lomas will be able to communicate in Arabic because you're living with them. And uh, people from other parts of Trinidad can then go to Las Lomas, you have weekend sessions, and, and spoken Arabic would then become, uh, uh, you'll be able to speak the Arabic language comfortably. And there should be no problem for visas because the people are being invited to come to Trinidad on religious grounds because this is an absolute imperative in our religion that we must be able to study the scripture and it is in Arabic. And so this was uh, last week in Las Lomas and we thank Allah that we had such a wonderful session there uh, in Las Lomas. Now, next week we're going to be in uh, Muhammadville, which is in El Sikoro. Uh, the proper pronunciation should be El Sokoro, but nobody says that. Everybody says El Sikoro. So next week uh, in Yawmul Ahad, uh, Sunday morning, at half past ten in the morning, you just drive down, you, the, there's only one road, you enter, you enter Muhammadville and you drive down and look for the sign saying Ramadan session, Ramadan session, and you'll find a place where the Ramadan session will take place and we'll be teaching how to study the Quran and please bring your children with you and uh, I will also make the effort to bring my books with me uh, so that those of you who want, who want to get copies of my books uh, we will have them available for you the book which will be used of course for the session is my book entitled Methodology for Study of the Quran and that book will have it available to you at a reduced price. Today is the 18th day, not the 19th, sorry I made a mistake, the 18th day of Ramadan. And now we prepare for the last one third of the month of Ramadan. There's one third of the month of Ramadan, which is um, for Rahma, another one third for Maghfira, for forgiveness, another one third for Qurba, I think for becoming close to Allah. And there are other scholars who would be um, constantly reminding you of these things pertaining uh, to the three parts of Ramadan. And it is, of course, in the last one third of Ramadan that you have laid to the Qad, of which the Quran has spoken. And I have lectured on the subject of Layla to the Qad, of course, in the past. And we have so many scholars of Islam, MashaAllah, who are there to teach you about Laylatul Qadr. What I have been doing is devoting myself to the link between the month of Ramadan and the Quran. 
That's what I've been doing all the time. Uh, because Allah says in the Quran, بَعْدَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بَعْدَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ He says, شَهْرُ رَمَضَانَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنِ That you are, these are the actual direct speech of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the Quran. شَهْرُ رَمَضَانَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنِ That the Quran was sent down in the month of Ramadan. Elsewhere we are told about the Quran being sent down on the night of Qadr, etc. And I have explained this in the past. It is because the Quran was sent down in the month of Ramadan that Allah chose the month of Ramadan for the fasting. And so as we fast in the month of Ramadan, our hearts should be drawing closer and yet closer to the Quran. I have said to you, do you remember? That something happened every night of Ramadan. Do you remember? Have you reminded others about it? <laughs> have you forgotten? That every night of Ramadan, Allah sent Jibra'il alayhi salam, the angel Gabriel, to Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. And the Prophet, Allah's blessing be upon him, would have to recite the whole Quran as was revealed so far. Every night of Ramadan. So he'd complete the whole Quran by the end of Ramadan. And Jibra'il alayhi salam would be listening to him. Hmm? And so it is the sunnah, divinely ordained sunnah, to recite the whole Quran from cover to cover in Ramadan, in Arabic. Did you hear that? Did you do it last year? Did you do it the year before? Did you do it the year before? Did you do it the year before? Have you ever done it in your life? How many times must we remind you? One day it will be too late. Please wake up. Are you doing it this month? If not, when will you start? When is it too late? Remember that when you go in the grave, you'll be tested. When the last person has left, 40 steps away, the angels are going to come in the grave to question you. Are you aware of that? And the preliminary question, not the questioning session, only the preliminary questioning, would be who is your Lord God and which is your prophet. And from the time you say my prophet is Muhammad, Allah's blessing be upon then your book is the Quran. If you say that my prophet is Moses, the book is the Torah. But if you say my prophet is Muhammad, the book is the Quran. So what will you do? If the angel hands you a copy of the Quran, and the angel commands you, recite, because that's the first word that came down in the Quran, Ikra, recite. And the Quran commands you, Tilawa, to recite, Utlu, recite the book. And when you open the book, you're only seeing Arabic. And then you ask the angel, can you give me an English Quran or a French Quran or an Urdu Quran? You betray the Quran. You might get the first blow. The angels are going to beat, beat, beat us on our faces and on our backs. Because this is disrespect, disrespect for the Quran. This is disrespect for Allah. What nonsense is this? What foolishness is this? What recklessness is this? That we should disrespect the Lord God himself. This is his word. So please stop what you're doing. Stop 
and learn to recite the Quran in Arabic. Because if you do not do that, you are disrespecting the book and disrespecting Allah and you'll pay a price for that. Hmm? And so it is this month that you must recite the whole Quran from cover to cover. Today is the 18th day of the month. So we would have already have recited a large part of the Quran already. Hmm? And I have in previous lectures suggested to you what should be your daily portion of recitation so that you can complete the whole book by the end of Ramadan. But in addition to reciting the Quran in Arabic, this is a month also to study the Quran because you know, as you fast, you deny yourself that which is halal, food is halal, drink is halal, to go to your wives and be, enjoy your wives and your wives enjoy their husbands, this is halal. And we give up that which is halal for Allah's sake. And in the process, we draw closer to Allah. Allah accepts our fast and we get nur. When you get nur in the heart, this helps you to, to understand, to study. You'll be able to see things which otherwise you could not see. This is a different epi epistemology from that which comes from the jazz godless Western civilization which has created all the universities in the world today with the secular educational system. They have their epistemology and the Quran has another epistemology. The Quran tells us that we get knowledge not only from our external observation and experimentation and rational inquiry, we also get knowledge from our internal source of knowledge, internally. We have external sight, we have internal sight. But there are those who have eyes and yet cannot see. Lots of them in parliament. Yes, we have those who have ears and yet cannot hear. We have those who have hearts and yet cannot understand. And most of them become our leaders in this world today, the last age. And so in Ramadan, there is some additional capacity to see what otherwise cannot be seen. Additional capacity to understand. So it's a good time to study the Quran. And uh, in order to study the Quran, you must be able to understand when it is being recited. That's why it's necessary to learn the Arabic language. And uh, the reason why Allah has given us the Salatul Tarawih, uh, for those who are not Muslims, Salatul Tarawih is a prayer, a long prayer that we have in the nights of Ramadan. And at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessing be upon him, we used to perform the Salatul Tarawih individually or in small groups. And then subsequently, not in the time of the Prophet, not in the time of Abu Bakr Siddiq, but in the time of Umar. At that time, the congregational prayer of Salatul Tarawih was instituted. So the Sunnah is to perform your Salatul Tarawih individually, not in Jamaat. The Sunnah is to perform your Salatul Tarawih in small groups. This is what happened with the Aslaf or the companions of the Prophet But if you want to perform it in the congregational Salat, that also is permissible. Yes. But uh, perhaps the wisdom the wisdom which sometimes escapes us in performing your Salatul Tarawih by yourself is that you have to recite. <laughs> when you go in the congregation of Salat, you get away because someone else is going to be reciting and you're just listening. But if you perform your Salatul Tarawih by yourself, you have to recite yourself. So you've got to memorize. 
So the Quran is not only to be recited, the Quran is not only to be studied, but the Quran is also to be memorized. I was unfortunate that as a child my father never sent me to the maktab. I never learned to, I could not read the Quran, no, I knew nothing about reading the Quran in Arabic. My father also could not do, he always had his English translation of the Quran. But my mother could recite the Quran in Arabic. But she never taught it to us, never. And so none of my brothers and sisters, none of them know how to recite the Quran in Arabic. And only late in life did I begin to learn. I was about 18 or 19, yes, when someone came from Guyana. Uh, after we went for that Muslim youth tour of Guyana in 1961, someone came and spent one week teaching us. And that's when I learned how to read Surah Al-Fatiha in Arabic at the age of 19. That's my misfortune, yes. Uh, but you don't have to be that mis unfortunate, no. You can start learning to recite the Quran and memorize the Quran and teach your children to do that so that you can perform Salatul Tarawih sometimes by yourself alone and you will recite, but you have to memorize to recite. And now I want to add one, some, one thing new now. Uh, and that is that if we are to recite, some people recite eight rakats and some people recite 20. But the amount of time should be the same. Yeah? Not because you recite eight, you take shorter time and 20 longer time. No. If you're reciting eight, you recite longer passages. If you're reciting 20, you recite shorter passages. Yes. That's it. But the amount of time should be the same. Um, now then, what I want to say is this, that you go to listen to the Quran being recited in order to benefit, to enjoy listening to the Quran and to benefit from understanding what is being recited in the Quran. And so, does it not make more sense that the, the, the the Quran should be recited continuously, not broken up into bits and pieces from here, here, and there. Because if you recite continuously, for, for example, from one surah, then there's a train of thought which will continually link from one passage to another in the surah. Allah divided the Quran into surahs, and these are walls separating parts. We call them chapters, but the Quran is called surah, and surah is a wall. So you have, for example, if you want to recite Surah to Yasin. Surah to Yasin is a beautiful surah. I think about 80 something ayat or verses in Surah to Yasin. You have to memorize the whole of Surah to Yasin. Yes. And did the Prophet not say, this is what he said. He said, I want every follower of mine to memorize Surah to Yasin. Everyone, everyone, each of us must memorize Surah to Yasin. He didn't say that for any other Surah, but he said it for Yasin. And he called Yasin the heart of the Quran, if I'm not wrong. He, I think he said that Surah to Yasin is the Qalb of the Quran. So you will be reciting the whole of Surah to Yasin, and you break it up into eight parts, for example, and you recite it in eight rakat of Salat. Uh, or you could re break it up into 20 and recite it in 20 rakat of Salat and Tarawih. But it'll be one continuous recitation, and not a piece from Surah to Baqarah, and a piece from this Surah, and a piece from that Surah, uh, and, and you do not get the message that is continuous that you can, you can reflect over it, you can think over it, and you can get the wisdom of what is in the Quran. So this is the new, new, method, new um, point that I want to introduce in today's session uh, to advise uh, those who conduct the Salat al Tarawih uh, that you should choose a surah, maybe a long surah, 
like Surah Al-Kahf, for example, Surah Al-Kahf, maybe what, 118, about 118 ayat, probably, I don't know about that. And that's a long surah. And then you will divide it into portions. So each part of the Salat al each rakat, you recite a portion continuously until you finish the whole surah. So that those who are listening would be able to concentrate on the whole surah in an unbroken trend of thought rather than to use disparate parts of the Quran in different uh, uh, rakat of Salat al-Tarawi. Um, they, of course, in previous, um, in previous uh, sessions of this month of Ramadan, I have considered, I have declared that the recitation of the Quran at breakneck speed is disgraceful. And there are still many masajid where this is happening. If you are listening to me today, uh, there will be a telephone number at the bottom of the screen. And if you want to call and let us know which masjid it is that is still doing it, we can try to contact the imam and try to explain to him. No, stop this. To recite the Quran at breakneck speed is prohibited by the Prophet himself, alayhi salatu wasalam. A, a Hindu will not do that with the Ramayana and the Bhagavad Gita and the Vedas and the Upanishads. No. A Christian will not do that with the Bible to recite it at breakneck speed. How can a Muslim do that with the Quran? This is betraying the Quran. And shall I remind you of Surah Al, uh, ah, Surah Al Furqan, Surah Al Furqan, which will be Surah number twenty-five, yes. And in this Surah, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala places a complaint, yes, in the Surah, and it is placed on the lips of the Prophet, alayhi Listen to the complaint. And the messenger of Allah complained. Ya Rabb, O oh my Lord God, inna qawmi takhazu hadha al-Qur'an mahjura. My people, my people, my people are forsaking this Qur'an. My people are making hijrah from this Qur'an, abandoning this Qur'an, forsaking this Qur'an, therefore betraying this Qur'an. This is a complaint in the Qur'an on the lips of the Prophet himself, alayhi One of the ways in which we betray the Qur'an is when we disrespect it. And reciting the Qur'an at breakneck speed, let me warn you one more time. Because you want to recite the whole Qur'an in Salatul Tarawi, which is not obligatory, and people have to go to work tomorrow morning, you engage in this disgraceful conduct of reciting the Qur'an at breakneck speed, and in the process, this complaint of the Prophet ﷺ applies to you. Terrible. Terrible can be your, your condition on Judgment Day. So please, do please, stop it. I am so happy. I cannot explain, I cannot describe my happiness. The Jama Masjid San Fernando has now stopped it. Alhamdulillah. And so now the Quran is being recited at Jama Masjid San Fernando at a wonderful speed. And the, 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 the Hafiz who is reciting it is pronouncing each word correctly, correctly. Of course, when you find someone blessed with a beautiful voice and who recites the Quran melodiously, then when you are listening, you cannot afford, you cannot help but cry. The, the tears will fall from your eyes. I have so much, still so much more to talk about today, but uh, let us, let us, and with that part now about 
reciting the whole Quran in Ramadan from cover to cover in Arabic. And if you, ha if you have brothers and sisters or friends who want help to learn to recite the Quran, please teach them so that next year they may do it. And of course, those of you who are doing it this month of Ramadan, when the day of Eid comes, don't stop. Whenever you finish the Quran, you must start again. And when you finish it, you must start again. And when you finish it, you must start again. Let it continue all through your lives. Teach it to your children. Teach it to your grandchildren. This is the best inheritance you can leave behind for them that your children and your grandchildren are reciting the Qur'an every day and completing the recitation of the Qur'an once a month. And Allah might build for you a house in Jannah. Now then, I have just a few minutes left and I want to now turn, how do we apply the Qur'an in the world today? How do we apply the love, the wisdom of the Quran here in Trinidad and Tobago? Our people expect our scholars to do that. If the world of Islamic scholarship does not apply the wisdom of the Quran to the concrete reality facing them, the scholars of Islam will have failed. Yes, the Quran. We now have a situation in Trinidad where we have an opportunity to apply the Quran to a matter seizing the whole nation. How should a scholar of Islam respond? Here is how it should be. Here is a response. Uh, the government of Trinidad and Tobago is proposing to, uh, to enforce a property tax on all those resident in Trinidad and Tobago. And uh, a property tax, of course, would mean it includes all kinds of property. But the property tax that is proposed, listen carefully, is based on the rental value of the property. Those who study this and propose this legislation uh, have not done their homework, no, unfortunately. And I doubt whether this will come out in the parliamentary debate as well. I doubt it. Uh, if, if in their wisdom they had allowed a voice of Islam to be present in parliament, independent voice of Islam, an independent voice of Hinduism and of Christianity, that you're not speaking in parliament on the basis of your attachment to any political party. No. You're speaking for Islam. You're speaking for Hinduism. You're speaking for Christianity. Then we could have had a chance to speak in parliament and say to you, what is the viewpoint of Islam? What is the viewpoint of Hinduism? What is the viewpoint of Christianity? So that the religious viewpoint might have a uh, might be expressed and articulated. Why do we have to do it outside? Why do we have to do it on on television, on radio? We don't have access. We only have access to IBN. That's the price you pay for being a Muslim. But no, they will not allow an independent voice of Islam or there or in the cabinet or even close to the prime minister. No. And so now, what do we mean by being reckless? I have very little time left, so I might have to return to this subject another time. A property tax based on the rental value of property. That's what the subject is. And we say it is misguided, it is unjust, it is reckless, and eventually there will be dire consequences ahead of us. In the little time that I have, let me demonstrate how a scholar of Islam would apply the Quran to concrete reality. Hmm? First of all, property can be 
commercial property. Commercial property brings in an income. Property can be agricultural property uh, and can also bring in an income. But property can also be your home where you live, your residential property. In Islam, we never tax the land. No, <laughs> Allah does not tax the land that you own. Allah taxes the produce of the land, the income that is derived from the land. It is that which is taxed. And he, attack, he, he taxes your income that you have as a person, not the landed property that you have is not being used, for example. If you have a commercial property and it's bringing in an income, then it is that income which should be taxed, not the property. If the property is just lying there, mothballed, not bringing in any income, it's unjust to tax that property. It is the income that is derived from the property which should be taxed. I want to suggest that the same thing applies to residential property. It is the income that is derived from a residential property. If you have rented a part of your home, then the taxation should be on the income. But if you are simply resident in a home, then your home should not be taxed. That's the first point I want to make. There's no income from living in a home. Common sense. But there's another part to the subject, and that is that property values and rental value in this chaotic market of fake money is volatile, volatile. When my father died in 1957, he was a school principal. And because he died while as principal, during his duty, the government gave to my mother some gratuity. And uh, she she got twelve thousand Trinidad dollars, and we had a parcel of land opposite the Market Square in Chaguanas, which my father had leased. And my mother was able, with the twelve thousand dollars, to build a house on that land. Uh, the money was not enough to complete the house, so there were we, we, there were some windows which had no windows and so on, uh, but we were able to complete and, li and move into the house with $12,000. Hmm? Uh, that same house to be built today would cost vastly more. And the value of that property today might be millions. That's what's happening in the market today. Yesterday, it was only 10, 12,000, today 10 million. Why? There are many different reasons for this inflation, this galloping value of properties, moving higher and higher and higher and higher. One of the reasons for it is inflation. And that is the value of money decreasing, collapsing. As money loses value, prices rise. The cost of properties rise because the value of the money is falling. This is not the only cause of inflation. But this is the most visible cause of inflation, the falling value of money, and therefore prices rising. And we cannot control the falling value of money. Even the US dollar, every single currency in the world has been falling in value. Even the Swiss franc, although that, the Swiss franc falls the least probably of all. But every, the US dollar, shall I tell you? The US dollar was worth 20, 20, just 20 US dollars was equivalent to one ounce of gold and it was redeemable. 
you can go and get your one ounce of gold for twenty dollars. And then it became 35, international law was $35 an ounce of gold, and it went 40, and then went to 160, and then went to 800, and today it's maybe 15, 1600 dollars an ounce of gold. That is how much the U.S. dollar has fallen in value. When we were children going to school, the U.S. dollar was 240, a sterling pounds was 480. Today the U.S. dollar in Trinidad is over seven. So the value of money is constantly falling. And uh, money also is being used, the attack, the, the inflation is being used as a weapon to bring governments under the control of those who in, instituted the monetary system and control it. Now what's the, what's the price we pay for instituting a property tax based on rental value? Answer? there will be some people who will not be able to pay the rental, the rental value of their property through no fault of theirs, none, would be so high that they will not be able to afford to pay the tax. Number two, that the rental value is itself volatile and will be constantly increasing, constantly increasing. And the income that people get do not, does not does not um, uh, uh, allow them to meet the, ex, ex, the, ex, the, the constantly increase in prices. It does not compensate. And so an increasing number of homeowners, people who are residing in a home, an increasing number will eventually not be able to pay the property tax and will then be forced to sell or rent their property and move to another area where they can afford to live. And that would of course be a cheaper area and therefore more likely to be prone to violence. And so your life could be in danger. Every time someone is forced to give up his home, it is unjust. It is an act of oppression. And you have to pay a price for that. And so this is reckless on the part of this government. And we want to warn you, a home is sacred. A home is where we live. You cannot enter a home without permission. That is from the Lord God, even if you are the police. You cannot enter a home without the permission of the homeowner. You must go to a judge in the court and get permission before you enter a home and break down the people's door and put blood on their faces and you would not even apologize for that. We have no respect for you. No. And so, Every time a homeowner is forced to leave his home because of your tax, we have to ensure that you pay a price for that. This is my final word because time is now up. We say that a property tax based on rental value of the property, which is volatile, which is the case of fake, fake, fake money in the monetary system. This is going to be an act of oppression and many people are going to be forced to leave their home. A rising number of people, constantly rising number of people because of the constantly rising value of rents and of property value. This is oppression and there'll be a price to be paid. And here is an example, I'm sorry I don't have enough time, here is an example of how we can use the Quran to apply it to concrete reality. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.